Solomon kind of bathes in his face of light. Uh, he's in profile. He's looking up. Uh, but he looks like, you know, an Anglo-Saxon. He looks like a white Jesus. So many, when you know, they think of Jesus, they think about this. Uh, prior to that, this was another popular image of Jesus. Uh, this is Christ Pantocrator. Uh, that's depicted uh, at St. Catherine's Monastery in Sinai. And this, too, became, for many generations, uh, the idea of what Jesus looked like. Uh, Jesus is clad in purple. He's holding a, a gospel book. And if you ever see an image of uh, Jesus or an apostle raising fingers and you're wondering what that is, well, that's a gesture of speech. That's How do you make a picture talk? Uh, well, that's how you do it. Uh, and so this is, uh, you know, Jesus holding a gospel book. So what is he doing? He's, he's not blessing. He's judging. This is Judge Jesus. Uh, so get ready. He's judging. Uh, but for many, this is what uh, Jesus looked like. And so it kind of gets down to this idea of uh, how do we know that's Jesus? Well, it's because you've seen it before, and it becomes kind of embedded uh, in our cultural memory. And that's true of many things, I think, uh, that we we see just uh, on, on the street or driving around, along, and uh, we don't take into account, but, uh, but they're there. So here's a, here's a little quiz. Have you seen this before? What is it? Nike. Nike. Yeah, it's the swoosh. It doesn't have any words by it, but if you saw this, you knew what it was trying to represent. Uh, you know, the brand Nike, right? Uh, you probably saw this from you know, a young age. Uh, now here's here's another one. This is uh, part, part question two of your quiz. First one, Coca-Cola. Everybody see it? It's the ribbon that's on every single can of Coca-Cola uh, that developed early on uh, with the Coca-Cola company. Uh, it's trademark. Now, how do you know that's Coke? Because you've seen it so many times, it's become kind of embedded in your in your memory, your subconscious. Uh, you see the, the color red, you see it kind of narrow, like uh, in the middle, uh, and you instantly kind of identify that as, you know, it's a can of Coke. It's not an imitation Coke, it's the authentic thing. Three stripes. Anyone? So what's at the back? Adidas. Adidas, yeah. Uh, whenever you see three stripes, not five, I think five is K-Swiss, uh, three is the trademark for Adidas. Uh, so again, you see this, uh, and in your memory, you kind of know. This one, I thought this one would be harder, but all my students guessed it. I thought that was going to be hard. <laughs> this is uh, the symbol for uh, the German automaker BMW. Again, these are, ad th these, are, uh, these are ads, these are symbols, yet I'll, you guess them within seconds. Uh, you know, my children, uh, before they could read, uh, they knew what McDonald's was, uh, just by driving around and seeing the golden arches. Uh, I was shocked. I was like, how did you know that? <laughs> it's like, it wasn't like they were geniuses, it was just because they watch television. <laughs> and they've seen the ads, and it kind of the image of the, of the M uh, kind of embeds itself. Now, you know, coming back to this, uh, for many generations, this became uh, the image of Jesus. Uh, so uh, someone called this American Jesus, uh, but Solomon's Jesus. Uh, so when you think about Jesus, this would pop in your head. Uh, Solomon also uh, had a, uh, the story had a kind of a miraculous provenance. He was uh, he claimed that he had a vision uh, before he sketched this out and then uh, you know put a brush to canvas. Uh, so it was almost had this uh, also this category of a, of a miracle image. But it also kind of uh, uh, isn't just in uh, a sacred space. This also moved into the private sphere, uh, where this would be in private homes. Uh, this image would be adorned in, uh, in, in anyone's home, uh, even to the point where in the 50s, people would carry this around like a baseball card uh, in their pocket, uh, like an image of Solomon's Jesus. Now, the interesting thing about it is uh, does it really square with what we call the historical Jesus? And when you study religion, the historical Jesus is the Jesus of history. Uh, what did the Jesus of history uh, look like? What did the Jesus of history uh, speak, do? Uh, what, can we, uh, what kind of biblical and extra-biblical evidence can we use uh, to kind of create a portrait 
of the Jesus of history, the historical Jesus. Uh, and Jesus of the history, I hate to tell you, uh, does not look like this, more than likely. Uh, why? Because he doesn't look like an, you know, an Anglo-Saxon uh, male with great skin and surfer, surfer boy hair. Uh, there have been some uh, efforts since the year 2000 uh, to try to create more of a, you know, an, an idea or an authentic rendering of the historical Jesus. Uh, this is one that was sponsored by the magazine Popular Mechanics that attempted to uh, do an archaeological rendering based on a first century uh, skull that was found in Israel. Um, and this is what they came up with. Uh, there have been you know, a couple others too, but they normally look like this. Uh, a Palestinian Jew uh, with dark hair, uh, dark eyes, uh, short likely, uh, ready skin, uh, and looking out uh, you know, at you is just the rendering of the artist. Uh, but far, far and away from the psalm and Jesus. So when I show this to students or when I show this to groups uh, and I show this image, uh, there is confusion. Uh, there's no knee-jerk answer like Nike or Adidas or Coke or Jesus. Uh, you know, what's interesting is one common answer is uh, terrorist uh, because it looks kind of like a mugshot and you know all of you are children of 9/11, uh, so this is uh, something that kind of also embedded in the cultural memory, and so that was the reaction uh, when shown to larger groups of people. But when in fact this image is probably closer to the historical Jesus uh, rather than the Solomon Jesus. So here's kind of some things I just want to talk about real briefly uh, today. One thing that uh, you know you'll hear about, I'm sure, in, a, in one of your classes here is uh, there's no mention of Jesus' physical appearance uh, in the New Testament. Uh, in the four canonical Gospels are the letters of Paul. There's no exertion or effort made to describe the physical appearance of Jesus, uh, which is kind of interesting. Um, for example, we know much more about the prophet Muhammad in the Quranic tradition uh, of what Muhammad looked like, uh, but very little about Jesus. Uh, which is interesting, and it kind of, uh, you know, wants, wants audiences to, to kind of wonder why, and part of it likely has to do with dating. Uh, you know, the earliest gospel written uh, in the New Testament canon was likely the Gospel of Mark, uh, dating suggested between 68 and 70 CE. Uh, if, you know, and, and the closest, this is probably on one of your quizzes, uh, the closest component of the New Testament are not the four canonical Gospels. What are they? The letters of Paul. The letters of Paul are closest to the life of Jesus, uh, beginning in the Pauline corpus with 1 Thessalonians around 49 CE. But still, uh, if the reckoning for Jesus' death is you know, around 30, 33 CE, that's a long time away. So uh, the New Testament authors weren't interested in the physical depiction of Jesus because they didn't know the historical Jesus. Uh, the closest component uh, to the life of Jesus is Paul. And what do we know about Paul? Paul never knew the historical Jesus. He knew the risen Jesus, uh, the revelation uh, that he describes or that he talks about. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, and later authors you know, are not as interested in it. Um, so what do we do? We kind of fill that gap uh, with uh, our own idea uh, of what you know, Jesus might have looked like. Uh, and that kind of creates uh, the early Christian artistic tradition uh, of these conceptions of Jesus. Um, so one question that you know, we'll try to you know, look at real briefly is, you know, how do we account for the lack of the biblical mentions of the image of Jesus, yet these images begin to proliferate well, these are comforting images. Uh, you know, Christians from the very beginning were very image conscious. Uh, they were very image oriented. Uh, they wanted to visualize their religion. And that included visualizing uh, Jesus and the apostles and other figures from the canon. So there is this attempt to do that, uh, to have to have some type of connection uh, through sight. Uh, you know, was important, uh, obviously, early on. Um, and then later on, second, our 
are Christians dominated by the European type Jesus that we'll show and kind of like the Salmon Jesus, the, uh, the Anglo-Saxon Jesus motif, uh, are, you know, is really the image of Jesus writ large, is it really kind of malleable to its audience? Is it like a cipher? Uh, is it just something that audiences uh, can kind of mold to uh, their own creation? Uh, so that's, you know, just something real briefly that we'll take a look at. Um, just to remind ourselves, uh, one problem, uh, or supposed problem, uh, when looking at uh, art in Judeo-Christianity, uh, you know, or in antiquity, is, you know, the text of the Second Commandment, uh, which I won't read aloud, but it's on the screen, and this is the prohibition uh, of idolatry. Uh, some traditions would ascribe this to suggest that uh, ancient Jews uh, were anti-iconography. -icon In other words, that they are against making art, or they would not image God, uh, or attempt to image God. Um, and of course, this is also used by later Christian traditions that support iconoclasm. Uh, don't use images based on the reading of scripture. Now, the problem with making bold predictions about history is someone's going to dig something up in the sand to prove you wrong. Uh, now, there's always these images of God that we have uh, in the Christian tradition. If you look at Michelangelo, uh, Christians began to depict God. Uh, not just Jesus, but notice that God, you know, especially in the you know, uh, Renaissance, uh, looks like a nice grandfather. Uh, a nice, you know, white grandfather. Uh, with heavy beard, uh, kind of in the sky, uh, and you know that kind of proliferates later on. But uh, Christians seem to interpret this commandment uh, rather loosely. Uh, they didn't have a problem with it. There are early depictions of God as well uh, in iconography. This is likely the earliest one that's on a Christian sarcophagus that dates from the fourth century, and this is the image of God that's seated right here. Uh, that's kind of uh, moving his hands in a, in a gesture of speech uh, towards uh, the creation event. This likely has been argued that this is trying to image the Holy Trinity, one, two, three, uh, in the sarcophagus. So early on, through depicting God, uh, yet there is the argument that, well, okay, but you know, Jews did not, uh, you know, they were not image rich uh, like, their, like their Christian counterparts. Well, it's hard to delineate the lines between uh, Jews and Christians early on because, um, shocker, Jesus was Jewish, uh, and all of his followers were Jewish, uh, and it, the lines between those two uh, you know, were very fluid early on. Uh, at a synagogue uh, uncovered in the 20th century uh, at a place called Dura, which was a Roman garrison town, they found a synagogue that was filled with art frescoes uh, of the Hebrew Bible, uh, depicting uh, scenes from uh, the Hebrew Bible, including Moses uh, and the prophets. And a way for them to depict God uh, was to not necessarily show the, the face of God, uh, but to show the hand of God, uh, kind of like a little hand reaching down. And this is uh, an image of the showing uh, Ezekiel in the Valley of the Dry Bones, where He's kind of, uh, you know, plucking these people up like marionettes and uh, putting them together. Uh, but that was a way around it. Um, yet there are other images of ancient Jews that suggest that they're icon, icon uh, conscious and icon rich. Uh, there are many floor mosaics that have been uncovered uh, in Palestine um, that feature uh, this, which is really interesting. Uh, it's, uh, you know, a, a mosaic that features the zodiac. Uh, and the zodiac, uh, symbols of the zodiac, which you can probably recall today, uh, are inscribed in Hebrew. This is at Hamath Tiberias. Uh, there are others uh, at places like Sepphoris. Uh, but in the center is uh, the god Helios, uh, who's kind of holding, uh, holding an orb. Uh, Helios was the god of the sun, uh, drove his chariot across the sky. Now, what does that have to do with the zodiac, you think? And why is this a circle? Well, what does Helios do? He moves across the sky. You know, beginning of the day and end of the day. So what is this about? Time. Uh, it's about time. Uh, it's about sacred time. Um, and it's kind of a way to delineate time. But also it shows one other thing that's important when you began to look at early, the earliest images of Jesus is it was very fluid. There were no strong borderlines between Jews and Christians. And there are also not strong borderlines between, and I'll use the word pagans, uh, but Roman religion. 
uh, which was also fluid uh, by depicting you know, you know, images of, of other gods. Because uh, you can adapt them. Uh, they perhaps may be just as malleable as a figure like Jesus. We also have texts that uh, have some prohibitions uh, against uh, making images. And again, I'm not going to uh, read this verbatim, but this is a funny little uh, apocryphal text. Uh, this non-canonical. Uh, if you're really bored in class one day, I think your professors would love it if you got online and looked at non-canonical texts, because they're all available in public domain, and they're really interesting, because it makes you wonder, why did they not get in the Bible? And then you'll begin to realize why. Uh, but this is one called the Acts of John. And in this one, John uh, you know, performs a miracle, and as uh, kind of like to honor John, this man named Lycomedes uh, does something that he thinks is a nice gift, and also natural. He makes his picture. He makes a portrait of him. Um, and then when John is confronted with the portrait, he's like, at first he's kind of like, ah, this is what I look like. Uh, I've never seen what I look like before. Uh, but then he excoriates like me. He's like, oh, what you did is, is just not, not, not useful. You can't really portray the true person with color and ink. Uh, it's not a true likeness. It's not a very, a very icon. But what does this show you? Well, the bottom of the screen there is a pagan icon. Uh, it's kind of showing you what early Christians uh, were doing. They're making images uh, because that's what other people do, uh, and they're interested in it. Uh, and so you have to have a text to suggest, like, no, don't do that. Don't, don't, don't be like them. Uh, there's another popular, uh, well-known letter by the church father Eusebius. Uh, he's writing to um, uh, Constantia, uh, who had asked for uh, an icon, an image. Uh, and he kind of excoriates her that, uh, you know, I'm not going to give this to you. Uh, he says, don't you know, no likeness should be made either of what is in heaven or what is in earth beneath. No, 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 no. Bad, bad, bad. Um, and again, we might remember a story from uh, the text uh, from the canonical New Testament. Um, that's from the Gospel of John. Uh, fun fact, uh, Doubting Thomas, what is known as Doubting Thomas, is only in the Gospel of John. Uh, and this is it. And, you know, we all, uh, if we are familiar with the text, you know the story. Uh, Thomas uh, doesn't believe uh, he needs physical proof of the resurrected Jesus. Uh, and then you finally have the last line where they, you know, excoriate Thomas. Uh, you know, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. So why do we have Christian texts like this? Uh, that are talking about images and sight, uh, but they're coming down on the other end and saying, no, don't do this. I think one, one thing as a reader, uh, when you see texts like that, A, you have to put them in context, in historical context, you also have to realize something. If they're, if they're making such an effort to excoriate it, it means they're doing it. Uh, it means that they're doing it. It means that they're very interested in creating art. Uh, and they're very image conscious uh, and, you know, interested in, in, in visualizing their religion. Um, and the way they would begin to visualize Jesus uh, from early on was adapting Roman prototypes. Uh, there's one early image, uh, and several of these exist, of Jesus as the Good Shepherd, uh, which also could be interpreted as Johannine, but it's also a Roman image. Uh, with a you know young boy with a, with a lamb on his back, it's protective. It's very pastoral, uh, but it also is kind of adapting you know a Roman image uh, and projecting it as Jesus. Also, Jesus plays dress up with other gods. Uh, there are other images that some would argue where Jesus is being cast as uh, a god. This is one that was found at the bottom of St. Peter's uh, Necropolis in a mosaic. Uh, where some have argued that this is kind of like that zodiac mosaic, where it's showing Christ as Helios, uh, the god of the sun, um, that's kind of depicting him in that guise. So, you know, it could be another case of, you know, adapting uh, and using that, that prototype. Now, what I've looked at and what I've found a lot of evidence for is Christians from early on were not only interested in uh, showing Jesus uh, in, in art, but they're also wanting to show him doing something. And more often than not, that's Jesus performing miracles. Uh, and many of these are directly from the Gospels, uh, and it's Jesus performing healing miracles, miracles of healing. 
Uh, and so there are many ones, uh, many instances, instances of these. And these are several from the catacombs, like this one here. This is a Jesus uh, healing uh, the woman with a hemorrhage, uh, where the woman is uh, just touching his cloak. Uh, and he, you know, the mirror is trying to portray that moment. Uh, and here's a very, uh, you know, one that's uh, uh, identifiable. And this is a Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. Um, many of these fulfill a familiar type uh, in early Christian art, uh, where Jesus is approaching a little burial house uh, where a mummified Lazarus is kind of wrapped up in. Uh, Lazarus is not normally uh, given facial features in the catacombs, although that will kind of change in sarcophagi in later Christian art. Uh, but Jesus is kind of uh, approaching it, uh, you know, with you know his little implement. Now, two things to note about this and some of these later instances of uh, images of Jesus. What's missing that was on the most popular Solomon image that's not on these earliest images of Jesus? He doesn't have a beard. The earliest images of Jesus are beardless. Uh, he's clean shaven. Uh, he does not have a beard. And one you know, question is, well, why doesn't he have a beard? <laughs> well, Romans, you know, typically were clean shaven. Uh, so Jesus is mirroring the audience. Um, and so just as the audience maybe are, you know, the audience of this particular catacomb may be clean shaven, so Jesus is clean shaven. Just became a style of portraying Jesus in, in this way. The other thing to note uh, that's also interesting is what is he holding, uh, you know, as he's approaching uh, the, the tomb of Lazarus? And this is something that appears readily and instances of early Christian art. Now, these are also uh, one popular medium of uh, early Christian art is what we call funerary art. Catacombs are places where the dead are buried. Um, and these are sarcophagus, sarcophagi. Uh, and this is where also where bones uh, or burned ashes are placed and are entombed. Uh, and early Christians, if they have means, uh, would decorate them, um, usually at some cost. The scenes that they would choose to decorate are more often than not all of miracles, uh, the miracles of Jesus. And they are usually involve uh, healing, uh, like uh, you know, changing water into wine, which these are the little jars here. Jesus poking someone's eyes out, that's actually healing the blind, uh, and dividing loaves. But then we have Lazarus again. Um, there is something kind of important to realize as you begin to kind of see all of these images of miracles. It's like, why, were so, why are they so important? Uh, why were miracles so important? And why were particular healing miracles so important? Um, well, one reason is miracles are awesome uh, to uh, really grow your religion. Um, I mean, if, if you were starting a religion, uh, you know, you just announced it in a leaflet in class. So like, new religion, stop on by, we'll have a bunch of cookies. Uh, five of you would show up. But if you performed a miracle, uh, or more importantly, if people talked about you performing a miracle, you're like, huh, ah, yeah, might be something to this. Uh, it's way to curry the faithful, to curry faith, uh, is this insistent on miracles. And it's particular to a late antique context, particularly healing miracles. Because, you know, how many of you have gotten sick, uh, you know, with this, you know, this month? Uh, I have. What do you do? You go to the doctor, you get antibiotics, especially if you have children. I'm pretty much hooked on them. Uh, and then you get better. Now, what happens if you get sick when you're in antiquity? You're going to die. <laughs> you're going to die. Uh, so what's important? Your health. Your health is a premium. Uh, your life is on the edge of a knife. Uh, so health is so important. So healing was important. And wouldn't it be a great PR move to project the paragon of your religion as a healer? Not only that, but an effective healer. And then, you know, what is Jesus kind of doing in some of these images where he's raising Lazarus? Well, he's doing the ultimate healing in a way. He's raising the dead to life. Now, that's good PR, and that's good advertisement, and that's good Christian advertisement to promote this idea of resurrection and redemption. It also sets Jesus apart uh, from competing gods uh, in this late antique system uh, because there are competing gods uh, out there uh, as Christianity is beginning to grow. 
and to show your God not only is more powerful than others, but also that your God uh, has power over life and death. That sets yours apart, um, and that's kind of important. Another thing that these images do is it connects Jesus uh, in art uh, to another miracle worker in the biblical tradition. And that's someone else that used uh, a little nice little implement that he's holding. Um, and that's not Jesus, that's Moses. Moses performed miracles in the book of Exodus. He was known by later Christians as, uh, you know, one of the most important miracle workers in the Bible. According to the Church Father Origen, there were only the two of the greatest miracle workers in the Hebrew Bible were Moses and Elijah. And guess who Jesus is depicted with at the Transfiguration in the Gospels? Moses, Elijah. Why? Because you want to show Jesus in the same guise uh, as a miracle worker as those two figures. Here's how you, you can do that in text. Here's how you do it in art, uh, in images, through what he's holding. Now, when I show these images to, to other audiences, one thing that is kind of interesting is uh, the common refrain, and this is true of some art historians as well, is what is he holding? Well, it's small, it's tapered, he's using it to perform miracles. So the suggestion is magic wand, <laughs> Harry Potter, wizard, uh, magician, and that actually had, there have been scholarly arguments to suggest that these uh, artworks are trying to make the assumption that Jesus is a magician. Now, here's where I've gone with this to kind of deviate from that, um, that it's not meant to be a wand at all. It's meant to connect him to Moses because it's not a wand, it's a staff. Uh, it's the staff of Moses. Uh, and that iconographic uh, symbol uh, kind of connects Jesus and portrays him as a new Moses, uh, as a Moses uh, that performs miracles, uh, just like Moses did in Exodus. Uh, the other argument uh, to you know kind of uh, take that take that suggestion down is uh, magic was a very real enterprise uh, in antiquity, uh, but no one used a wand like this. <laughs> no one used it like in movies, like uh, Harry Potter. Too bad. Uh, but if you look at the practice of magic, uh, using an implement like a, a litus, a raptos, or a verga, uh, it's either secondary or tertiary. Guess what the most important thing uh, in magic is? It's kind of creepy. Spells. Uh, and it's reciting spells. Uh, and again, it's also some would consult a magician to uh, promote health if they get sick. Uh, it also protects the magician uh, in his enterprise because uh, if there's a spell and effective sp magic is doing the spell correctly and you're still sick, you go to your magician and say, I want my money back. Guess what the magician can say? You didn't do the spell correctly. <laughs> go do it again. <laughs> so spells were more primary. Uh, magic wands, not so much. Uh, so this is really, in my mind, meant to connect him, uh, like in these instances, uh, instead of a instead of a, a magic wand, uh, it's a staff. So, uh, you know, the beardless Jesus, uh, the miracle working Jesus, the healer Jesus, are all kind of iterated on these uh, early images. Now, that also connects him in a way to another God uh, that I beg you to remember. Uh, why? Because it's, he's just so interesting and so awesome uh, in his stories. And this is the God of health. This is God of healing, Asclepius. This is the Latinized spelling. But I bet often uh, you might have seen the symbol of Asclepius on a drugstore or maybe an ambulance, uh, a serpent entwined staff. Uh, that was the symbol of Asclepius. Uh, Asclepius' uh, cult was one still very popular well into late antiquity. There are mentions of him that even move into the medieval, early medieval era. Uh, so he was a real comp you know, competitor uh, to early Christians, uh, isn't it? You know, kind of interesting that all these images of healing uh, and miracle working are in this context of competition with another healing cult. You know, Dr. Jesus is more effective than Dr. Asclepius. Uh, also, in Dr. Asclepius' myth, guess what he died of in his myth? He was, a, he was born of a human uh, mother and a divine father. That sounds kind of familiar. Uh, but he was killed for doing one thing. He raised the dead to life. 
and Zeus threw a thunderbolt at him and believed he you know, went beyond his, uh, his earthly bounds. Uh, and now here, Jesus is raising Lazarus, you know, kind of completing, uh, completing something successfully where Asclepius failed. Uh, now, early images, as you kind of progress in the visual canon, also take on the valence of other gods, not just Asclepius. Uh, this is a seated Jesus that's in Rome in an apse called Santa Potenziana, and Jesus is clad in gold. Uh, he's seated in a large throne. Uh, some would argue that uh, he's meant to mirror maybe not the god of Asclepius, but the god uh, Zeus, Jupiter, uh, actually, uh, using his Roman name. Uh, but this is when the heavy beard, the bearded uh, Jesus becomes more prolific. Uh, kind of using the beard uh, to channel, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, the competition in a way. Um, and you see that in other apps images, uh, such as this one, which is in San Vitale, uh, across uh, the peninsula in, in Ravenna. And here you have Jesus in his really cool beanbag chair. And he's clad in purple. Um, and this is also a church that was built by Justinian. Uh, he was the emperor at the time. Uh, and it could also not just meant to channel, uh, you know, Justinian, but, uh, you know, the, the power and gravitas of the emperor or the imperial cult. Um, one other fun fact about this, which, you know, this is just fun stuff to talk about. Uh, beanbag chair, uh, Jesus, purple, color of the emperor, uh, but look what he's sitting on. Uh, it's a rock, and there are one, two, three, four rivers. Now, this is another way that art can project uh, theology. And so the Christian tradition is, is very effective in doing that. Uh, you know, one uh, thing that's going on here is the need to show Jesus as divine. Uh, there are many Christological like controversies going on, um, and Nophicitism and others, uh, but the need to show Jesus as, as divine, and here's how you do it in art. Uh, look, look at the part of the creation story of uh, the Garden of Eden, and guess how many rivers in Eden there are? Four. Uh, it's the four rivers of creation. This is meant to place Jesus at creation, uh, and that would secure uh, the notion of a divine, an eternal Jesus, a Jesus outside of time, uh, a Jesus that always was, almost like John's Jesus in a way, uh, the divine Logos. Uh, and that's where art uh, and theology can kind of intertwine to project uh, these attitudes uh, that became important. There did become more of a normative way to depict, you know, a European-style Jesus. The only text that begins uh, yeah, to move in that direction uh, is the supposed letter of Lentulus, uh, which was fraudulent, uh, but it was written around the 15th century. Uh, and it was kind of combined with another European artwork that began to suggest what Jesus looked like. Again, there were no mentions of what Jesus looked like in the Gospels. Uh, instead, uh, we have this uh, supposed letter that talks about it. And it talks about his, the aspects uh, of his facial features. Hair the color of an unripe hazelnut. Smooth, almost to the ears. Uh, but below his ears curling and rather darker and more shining. Uh, his brow is smooth and quite serene. No fault can be found with his nose and mouth. He has a full beard of the color of his hair, not long but divided in two of the chin. So it's parted at the middle. Uh, and this, too, began to project ways to show Jesus in art, uh, you know, such as uh, Da Vinci's, uh, you know, and Raphael's, uh, a very, you know, doe-eyed, hazelnut-featured, uh, you know, soft, serene Jesus. And art, European art, could also project different attitudes, not just divinity, uh, but also darker features, sacrifice, pain. Uh, this is a famous image called Grunewald's Eisenhain altarpiece, uh, and in it, Jesus is hanging in the cross, uh, and this is one that shows blood at the foot of the cross, uh, and Jesus is not dead yet, he's suffering. Uh, and this is meant to project that image of suffering. But here's also where looking at these images in historical context matters. Because at the time of the creation of this piece, uh, it was placed in a monastery that also served as a hospital. And at the time, there was an outbreak of plague. Uh, it was from uh, eating bread that was made with a fungus uh, that was on uh, barley, rye, and wheat. Uh, and it was called St. Anthony's Fire. 
and it would manifest itself uh, in you know, bloody sores and pustules on your skin, and you would die from it. There was no cure for it. But if you look closely at Grunewald's Jesus, uh, he has pock marks all over his skin. Uh, his skin is lesioned. Uh, it's, it's in pain. And why? Because the patients are looking at this. And so, in a way, it's a comforting image. Jesus is dying of the same affliction as they are. Uh, and then this is what's called a, an altarpiece. So it folds in, and when you fold it in, it shows the resurrected Jesus. Um, so this is how you know, some of these later images, yet while they show a white European Jesus, are also taking some other things into account into projecting attitudes. And so you know, we come back to Solomon's Jesus, and we have you know, the uh, you know, anglicized version. Uh, but even in our American context, we have different attitudes. So this is Kentucky Jesus, which is where I'm from. Um, this man is an artist uh, you know, from Versailles, Kentucky. Uh, he's, he is quite popular. Uh, he has uh, you know, an, a website called Art for God, um, and he's been featured in different publications, even the New York Times. Uh, but while this might have been kind of a, a softer uh, Jesus, some artists, you know, especially if you read texts like The Man Nobody Knows, wanted a more masculine Jesus, uh, a Jesus that reclaims uh, his masculinity uh, in maleness uh, instead of femininity and softness and sereneness. And so you have, you know, uh, Jesus, you know, looking tough as a boxer, <laughs> helping firemen. <laughs> They're a lot, too. <laughs> They're quite interesting. Uh, and then occasionally they're combined with other Salman images, or he's kind of taking riffs off of Warner Salman. Uh, Salman had other portraits that kind of plop that head of Christ onto different contexts. Uh, this is one helping out a sailor at sea, uh, and this is Sawyer's uh, updated version. Uh, here's another, which is known as Christ knocking at heart's door. Um, and then here's a little bit more sinister, I don't know, <laughs> uh, version of it. Uh, but again, it's kind of adapting it and taking kind of a, you know, a, a, taking a more masculine approach to how they depicted, uh, how one would depict Jesus. Uh, here's finally one final one where uh, he's healing this kid's bird and kind of looking past them in a way. Uh, and then he's healing this kid's bunny, uh, but also looking up in kind of a stable triangle figure. Um, so these are just kind of ways and riffs how these can uh, kind of move. Uh, and they also occur in different, in different ways, shape, or form, not just, uh, you know, uh, white maleness or, or, or that sort of thing. Um, Mark Chagall had a series of paintings, uh, you know, yellow crucifixion, and this is white crucifixion. This is in the Art Institute in Chicago, uh, where it wanted to reclaim the Jewishness of Jesus. So Jesus is portrayed uh, in a prayer shawl uh, at the crucifixion. Uh, and surrounding Chagall's crucifixion are depictions of his context, which was Kristallnacht, uh, and you know, burning synagogues, and the removal of uh, Torah scrolls, and fleeing uh, you know, uh, you know, problematic circumstances. Um, this was a, an attempt to show uh, Jesus as a Jew. Um, and even you know, more interesting, in the year 2000, there's a contest that was sponsored by the National Catholic Reporter and it was a contest to uh, show uh, an image of Jesus for the new millennium. Uh, and this is the one they selected. They called it Jesus 2000. Um, and they, the artist portrayed uh, Jesus as a, uh, as a female, uh, as an African female. Um, so that's why when uh, you know, we look at these, uh, you know, they're really, there's, there's not one uniform depiction of Jesus. Uh, they're they're Jesus. Uh, they're Jesus. Uh, that's my term, don't use it uh, without my permission. Um, but it, it seems that uh, the multiple iterations of, of Jesus reflect more uh, of this basic need of seeing a figure as a source of comfort. Um, but it's very far from that first century port, you know, that first century uh, man from Galilee. Um, you know, Christians are very visually oriented today uh, as they were in the first centuries. Um, but perhaps it's useful to recognize these Jesai uh, as genuine in a sense, or at least just as important or authoritative um, as the white European Jesus or the Salmon Jesus. Um, images of Jesus mirror their audience, it seems. Uh, so shouldn't Christians accept such a diversity 
of images of Jesus as reflective of our communities rather than prioritizing one trope over another. Um, Christians always have this desire to see their faith, and as evidence, there are multiple ways of seeing Jesus rather than one, and none of them are very reflective of the Jewish movement leader from the first century. So what's kind of interesting is that these images that you see today, they're rather, they don't serve as one way. Uh, and it's, it's rather like a mirror. Uh, you look uh, and perhaps you see yourself uh, or you see uh, other audiences. Uh, but it gets down to kind of a way of seeing in a way. Now, there's one final thing I wanna note, and this is gonna be rather fun. Uh, there's another way of seeing Jesus in American culture that I also find quite humorous and quite inter interesting that's not in two-dimensional art. Uh, it also speaks to this also consistent attitude towards miracles, uh, towards wanting to see the ineffable, uh, even in ordinary items. And now these instances are foodstuffs. And these happen, you know, come into news cycles again and again. Uh, these, some of these are rather dated. Uh, one is the Jesus fish stick, uh, you know, right there, uh, which is burned and has a face of Jesus, or the grilled cheese Virgin Mary. Uh, this used to be the Jesus tortilla because it got destroyed in 2008. Uh, but before it, uh, about, you know, 20,000 visitors had gone to see it. <laughs> so it, and these, many of these have been sold or auctioned off. Uh, on eBay. So it does kind of speak to this very, you know, modern idea of wanting to see uh, and see, you know, one's faith in the ineffable, uh, even if it seems rather ludicrous. Um, and then the last thing is just uh, more of a longer anecdote of my personal experience with this. Um, I went to Vanderbilt University and there was a, a coffee house uh, that I used to study at. And it was called Bongo Java. It was next to Belmont University. And so one day, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, worker the, was uh, making cinnamon rolls. And out popped this one. And, you know, everyone looked at it and was like, you know what? That looks like Mother Teresa, who is, you know, the famous Catholic nun. Uh, and, you know, really, others were like, yeah, that kind of does look like Mother Teresa. I, which you can kind of tell by, you know, the hood and the little nose. Uh, so the owner of the coffee house, you know, was like, you know what? We're going to market this. So he called it the Nun Bun. <clears throat> and the Nun Bun became a Nashville phenomenon, uh, which you can Google uh, even today. Uh, the Nun Bun, uh, he sprayed it, put it behind glass, uh, you, know, you know, featured it prominently, but also made t-shirts, coffee mugs. Done nun bun wear to the point where it got word got out and he did receive a letter that was signed by Mother Teresa uh, asking him to stop profiting from her likeness, <laughs> which was humorous to him because the owner of Bongo Java is Jewish and he's like I don't, I don't have a stake in any of this I'm just you know it's capitalism. Uh, now, what was interesting about this and this, this narrative is this idea of seeing is still, is still very real and it, it, draws, uh, it draws ire from, from all, all areas. Uh, I, Catholics, mostly in Nashville, found it to be humorous. Uh, they didn't find it to be offensive. Uh, some Protestants thought that this was a mockery of their religion. Um, so, 2008 comes along. Um, there's a break in at Bongo Java. On Christmas Eve, December 24th, one thing was stolen, the nun bun. <laughs> the only thing was stolen, so sadly, the nun bun doesn't exist anymore. I mean, that's, that's uh, this combines everything, you know, we've talked about. Uh, you know, seeing is believing, idolatry, uh, but the visual is still important, and we still have these moments of, uh, of visual theology. Uh, even today, um, and this, these, these are just iterations of, of these that may appear mundane, uh, but they're actually, you know, kind of prolific. So thank you very much for paying attention and for listening. To me.
questions, uh, be happy to field them. Yes. Um, on that picture of Moses, was that a swastika on his, uh, on his clothes? <clears throat> You're an astute observer. <clears throat> Let me go back to it. This is from a, a catacomb known as the, uh, it used to be called the Via Latina, but it's uh, really on a road called the Via Dino uh, Compagni. And uh, yes, uh, if you look at it closely, uh, you know, one thing to notice is Moses is also clean shaven. So while Jesus is clean shaven, uh, you expect to see Moses uh, with a heavy beard like Charlton Heston. No, it's not there because uh, he looks like a Roman. Now, that is, that is not graffiti. That is not something that's been uh, desecrated to this image. That's original. Uh, and yes, it is a swastika. So uh, what does that mean? This is also a good point because it also talks about the language of symbols uh, and how symbols kind of get appropriated over time. Um, if you know the history of the swastika, um, it's of Indic ori origin. And uh, if you look at it, it's got you know, these little you know, arrows, not arrows, but uh, arms that are kind of pointed. And what does it kind of suggest? In a way, it suggests rotation. Uh, it's moving, uh, and just like that zodiac, you know, what could that symbol possibly mean? Renewal, redemption, it's a positive symbol. It was understood as a positive symbol uh, for centuries, but the Romans are including this on the hem of Moses' cloak uh, with that understanding. And also, guess what? What's the context of this? It's a catacomb. It's where the dead are buried. Isn't that a nice symbol to include about renewal? Uh, renewal of the dead. Now here's where the language of symbols just takes on new valence. Uh, you know, we see this and just like you did, you're like, whoa, it's a swastika. Because what does a swastika mean to us today? It's been imbued as a symbol of hatred, of racism, of master race, uh, you know, through uh, the Nazi party uh, in the 20th century up to today. It's a symbol that probably the positive valence of it can't be reclaimed. But yet that's how it was understood. Uh, for a long time, but now uh, it's it's always going to have that that understand of of, of, of hatred and racism. But good good eye. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> in the discussion of whether it's a magic wand or a or a staff, staff yeah, right? is the, if it's a staff. So like we think about Charlton Heston. Like going, so, so in the movie, The Ten Commandments, right? He's got a staff. Yeah. Right? And we think of a staff. Ruddy. We think of this thick. big, huge thing, right? Mm -hmm. Is is this, a, could this be an indication that, like, what they're talking about, if they talk about a staff at that time is more of a cane or something like that? I mean, was this, is this an indication that, like, that term has changed over time? Or. Yeah. Um... In catacomb and sarcophagi art, it's more thin. Uh, and that's probably due to the artistic tradition and maybe the, you know, the icon books that they're using of you know, how to show Moses' staff as a staff, of what they thought of the staff. Now, there are other types of staffs that are more ruddy, like a sleepy's staff, which is more like you know, uh, you know, Gandalf's staff. Uh, but, when it's in the act of doing something, like when someone's holding it, especially, it's thinner. Uh, and for sarcophagi, I think it's due to carving techniques. Uh, and on catacomb art, that just became the artistic tradition of how to project uh, a staff as a staff. But again, it's it, kind of a language of symbols. It's like when we see it today, we're imbued with all of this you know, great fantasy literature that has magic wands. Uh, and it's, it's not the same. Okay, so you don't have to have questions. You can also enjoy refreshments. So. <laughs> all right, if we could thank Dr. D. Jefferson.